Welcome to Broken Law, brought to you by the American Constitution Society, a 501c3 nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. I'm Jeannie Hereska, and I'm joined today by Joanna Shepard and Michael Kang, co authors of the book Free to Judge The Power of Campaign Money in Judicial Elections. We speak often on this podcast about how state courts have become battlegrounds for our fundamental freedoms and how judicial elections have become more expensive and more partisan as a result. So on today's episode, we ask the question, what is the impact of judicial elections on judicial decision making? According to my guests, campaign money profoundly affects how judges do their jobs. We're going to dive into this, but first, a brief note on my guests. Professor Shepard is Thomas Simmons Professor of Law at Emory University School of Law, and Professor King is the Class of 1940 Professor at Northwestern Pritzker School of Law. Professor Shepard, Professor King, welcome to Broken Law. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jeannie. We're excited to be here. It is wonderful to have you both. I always enjoy speaking to the authors of books. So I'll start with kind of an obvious question, which is what inspired you both to write this particular book? Well, I can I can start off this question, Michael. Um, Michael and I have been, we used to be on the same faculty at Emory before Michael was at Northwestern. And during that time, um, we had several conversations about judicial decision making. Um, we've really been co-authoring uh, various law review articles and empirical papers in this area for over a decade now. And it really kind of combines both of our interests. I'm an economist. I do a lot of empirical work. Um, I've been studying judicial decision making for a bit. And Michael is a political scientist who um, a lot of his work is focused on election law. So it was kind of a natural marriage of each of our skills and interests. And and that's why we originally started writing in this area. Um, The impetus for this specific book was partly, you know, we've looked at so many different influences on judicial decision-making and the way that money plays a role in both the elections and on judges voting in these cases, it felt like it was a natural time to compile a lot of our research into a book. And we also had some interesting new findings and interesting new data looking at kind of the specific pathway that money uh, through which money influences judicial decision-making. And we were excited to share that um, with the public more broadly, we don't think a lot of people necessarily read law review articles, although they might like to. Um, and so we thought this would be a, a good opportunity to uh, publish a book that might be read more broadly. An interesting question that I had when I was reading it is, I think if you asked people, do you think campaign money influences decision making generally? I think most people would say absolutely. I don't think it would surprise anyone that elected officials are influenced by campaign funding. But we're talking specifically about judges who are not supposed to be influenced by these sorts of things. So this is an obvious one, but I'm just interested to hear you both talk about it. Why do you think this topic when it comes to judicial decision making is such an important topic to shed a light on? Yeah, I think judges are different than other kinds of elected politicians and representatives. We think of executive officers and legislative representatives is representing the policy views and preferences of their constituents. And that's part of their job. So I might worry that money plays too big a role. It gives too much weight to those with wealth as opposed to those uh, voters and constituents with a little bit less. Um, but the idea that elected officials and the executive and legislative branches are responsive is not a crazy one. It, there, there's some normative kind of value to that sort of responsiveness. We think of judges as a little different. We think of judges as um, kind of upholding the rule of law, um, which doesn't give special weight to a certain set of constituents based on how much they can help a judge get elected or reelected. We think that they ought to take an impartial view about how justice is dispensed. Um, And when we see that certain constituents campaign donors are exercising a greater weight in the process by virtue of the money they put in the system. We think that's that's not right, that judges are different. And and actually, the Supreme Court agrees with uh, that view. The Supreme Court treats elected judges differently. Um, There's a slightly different constitutional framework when it comes to campaign finance for judges and the standards by which judges are um, are held to. Elected judges are a weird case uh, because there are a lot of voters who do think of judges as kind of politicians, and it's something that lawyers and judges kind of fight against. But the system puts judges in a very difficult position, and and our book and our work 
tends to portray a system that might be tilting too far in the elected representative direction and giving too much weight to money. And that really worries us. So building off of that, Professor King, is there a year or a point of time where you guys point to as kind of the tipping point? Because it's been getting judicial elections have been getting more expensive, more partisan over the last decade or two. Is there a year you point to where it was like this was the point of no return? In our in our book, we actually have a a one chapter that's devoted to the history of how we got to where we are, and I th- I think we think of there being a few different points um, where things started changing a bit. One was really kind of in the early '90s. That's when you first started seeing an initial increase in the amount of money spent in these elections. We can go. We we do go into why that is and why we think that is. A lot of it has to do with the kinds of cases that state supreme courts were hearing. Um, just in in it, in general, you know, there there tended to be a lot of uh, challenges to tort reform, which was playing a big role in the amount of interest group involvement in the elections. And so, in the early '90s, it, it varied a little bit state by state, but you start seeing an increase in money in the first place. Then you, after that, you had some important legal cases that w- we think really impacted things too. In uh, 2002, there was the Minnesota v. White case. Um, which allowed judges for the first time to basically state their opinion on kind of political issues, which kind of changed the nature of before that, a lot of judges would not have been doing that. It might have been against their, uh, the the law in their state. Um, And so that kind of change the nature of, I think, judicial campaigning. And then, of course, 2010, the Citizens United case really changed the way in which the money was flowing into the election. So prior to that, um, the vast majority of money was going straight to the campaigns. Uh, it was very easy to identify who the donor was and how, what the money was being used for. But after that, as we know, Citizens United allowed a lot more uh, money uh, to flow in through what sometimes people refer to as like dark channels, where you don't know who's giving the money, you don't know what the money is being used for. And there was a huge increase in the amount of money from interest groups through these sources through which you couldn't identify the donors and, and what the money was being used for. And and that kind of changed the way these campaigns were being conducted a bit. A lot more of that dark money tended to flow into like negative TV attack ads. And so um, we actually have a completely different study, but we talk about it in this book as well, looking at the impact of these uh, very negative TV ads that attack the way a judge voted in a single case, typically without any explanation or nuance about what the case was actually about. Um, and so the, the 2010 was a big inflection point too, where we see different kinds of money in and the nature of the judicial campaign started changing as well. Can I ask for just numbers on this? I think most folks understand that elections have become more expensive, but what are we talking about when we say judicial elections have become increasingly expensive with uh, especially the, the increase in dark money? So if you look at the 90s, that's where we saw the increase in money in the first place, regardless of of its source. In the 1990 election cycle, about $10 million was raised across all state Supreme Court elections in the U.S., whereas in 2000, in the 2000 election cycle, so this is just Mm -hmm. a decade later, $70 $70 million was raised in, in elections. And that's, you know, those are in real dollars. So that doesn't, you know, inflation's not impacting anything. So during that decade, we see a sevenfold increase in the amount of money raised. And then um, with Citizens United in 2010, there was immediate increase in the amount of money um, flowing in through kind of these these dark channels. Um, so, for example, in the election cycle right before the Citizens United decision, about 15 percent of total spending was uh, contributed by interest groups through these channels that were difficult to identify donors and, and the uses. In the election immediately after the Citizens United case, that number went to um, 26%. And now I'll tell you the last election cycle for which we have data, which is the 2020 election cycle, it broke all sorts of records, not in a good way. So oh, about a hundred million dollars was raised, um, in the 2020 election cycle. For just judicial about- elections. 
for just for just state Supreme Court wow. judicial election. So even just a very, you know, most states have seven to nine yeah. uh, state Supreme Court justices. They're not all even running for election at the same time. So it was a huge amount of money. It was about 17 percent higher than the previous record that was set. And again, this is controlling for inflation and all of that. So we're not, you know, um, in addition, you had a lot more judges running in who won elections with significant spending. So, for example, there had never been states in which over $10 million was st- spent on Supreme Court races. And there were five states um, in that year in which over $10 million was raised for a single campaign, or for a single election. Um, and in addition, you had a lot more money coming from interest groups. So in the 2020 election cycle, um, interest groups spent over $35 million in these state Supreme Court races. And to be clear, it, it this isn't the result of there being like more judges running or more elections or anything like that. All of that is, is controlled for. It's just there's more and more money flowing in through different through different things. And listeners of Broken Law will know this because we've talked at length about the Wisconsin Supreme Court election earlier this year, which was the most expensive state Supreme Court election in history. So we're just going to continuously make history in the wrong direction. And I I wanted to add something about change over time and why the state Supreme Court elections have gotten so much more expensive and politicized. I I think Joanna did a great job of outlining how the law has changed over the last Uh, 30 years, but the politics have changed a lot too. And so what we've seen, especially since the end of the Cold War is what, you know, political scientists and a lot of election lawyers call hyperpartisanship, that the parties have gotten a lot more competitive and angry at each other. um, And they've become more polarized. That is, they're more cohesive internally and farther apart ideologically. And that's raised the stakes for all kinds of elections, uh, certainly at the federal and, and state level, um, but even sometimes at the local level. So it's not a surprise that a lot of that viciousness, competitiveness, uh, expensiveness has really spread to the judicial races as well. Um, and that's that's really the, the political side of things, that hyperpartisanship has sort of taken over politics uh, in every direction. And, and the state Supreme Court races are, are certainly no exception to that. And I think also because the parties are so polarized and competitive, the funders, the people who are making the, the contributions, think it's a good investment, that there's a real difference now between electing a Democrat and a Republican um, to a state Supreme Court. And sometimes the payoff is, is much better than what you can get in executive or legislative races because there's not as many seats on the state Supreme Court. And state Supreme Courts decide a lot of really important law that um, affects our lives. I think in our book, one of the points we tried to make was that as certainly in law school, but I think generally in American society, we really focus on the federal courts and the U.S. Supreme Court because it's taking on a lot of the big constitutional issues that we think about a lot, like abortion or campaign finance. But actually, the the state courts decide you know more of the law that kind of affects you on a daily basis, and so. I think the people with money to spend in politics realize this is a good investment. We don't have to change that many races. The state Supreme Court races have gotten a lot more expensive, but they're not nearly as expensive as a presidential race or a gubernatorial race. Um, So the payoff can be really, really strong. And there's a huge difference between electing uh, a Democratic majority in a state Supreme Court or a Republican majority. And you see that in states like Wisconsin and North Carolina, where the state Supreme Court kind of swings back and forth on the basis of one seat. Um, And there's a huge difference in the state policy as a result of that. And I'll just add one more thing to what Michael said as well. Um, He mentioned that, you know, it is much cheaper this getting involved in the state Supreme Court race than in a a governor or a, or a presidential race. But, um, at this point, actually, there is more money being spent in state Supreme Court races than there is in state legislative races. And we have these great quotes. We have a lot of interesting quotes because we did a lot of interviews um, for the book. And also we were able to pull kind of some interviews for, that other people have done. And there's uh, a great quote that we have in the book from um, a particular interest group that was talking about their decision to start spending more money in state Supreme Court races. And they said, we just figured out it's a lot easier and cheaper to elect seven judges than 132 legislatures. And, and to be clear, you don't actually need seven. You only need, you know, if you've got seven members of the court, you only need four to have the majority. Or if you have a nine member court, you only need five. Um, and so it's very rational that 
this that the money started, you know, f- flowing in there and, in the way that it did. Yeah, it's it's a really harrowing example of you get more bang for your buck when you go in and spend on on courts. So I want to get into the the argument of the book and really give you both a chance to explain it here, which is that campaign money profoundly affects how judges do their job, which goes against everything people are taught about judges, right? That they're objective, that they look at the law, they look at the facts. Oh, no, lo and behold, they also consider campaign funding. So talk to me about that. How did you reach that conclusion? Um, I want to hear both the the data part of it, because this book is just so, so data driven, but also you did all those interviews and what, what you make of that conclusion from talking to folks on the ground. Yeah. I mean, our sense is that the money matters more and more as we've sort of discussed. And that definitely came through in the interviews. I don't think any judge says the money affects them. (laughs) Most of the judges, when they, when you talk to them, think it matters in the system. It affects judges kind of as a general matter. And I, I believe that they don't think that the money is affecting them. So we're not making the argument that the money is, is creating a conscious calculus where they're thinking, I've got to help this donor. There's not quid pro quos going on. Candidates aren't going right, out there right. and saying, pay uh, me and I'll rule this way. Yeah. I mean, it, maybe that happens in the most egregious cases, but we don't think that's probably you know the most common case. Um, but what we found over the last 12, 14 years in doing this work is find a pretty consistent pattern where um, certainly there's, there's an effect of money uh, in terms of uh, judicial decision making that the the decisions line up with the money um, in a way that we can show empirically, and that's robust and consistent. When we would present our work, one of the questions we would often get is, "Well, why does that happen?" And that was usually directed toward the question of causality. It might be that judges are changing their decisions to help their their donors. But an alternative story that's not completely inconsistent, they both could be going on, is that maybe the contributors are just smart about who to give the money to, right? So it's a selection problem. Um, And the judges aren't really changing how they're deciding cases. They're just lined up with their contributors. So it's no surprise that the money and the decisions uh, are aligned. And at the beginning, we weren't that um, interested in this question because we thought the kind of larger problem is that money gets what it wants. And whether it gets it through selection or it gets it through some sort of biasing effect, um, it seemed troubling to us either way. But we noticed in the data that we analyzed, we consistently found that judges who couldn't run for re-election because they faced a mandatory retirement age always behaved a little bit differently when it came to money, that they showed less effective money. So we thought that was telling, um, and we thought we would orient the book around that. And so this book really tackles causation. And what we find is that judges, all judges, show some effective money. And that's not surprising because of the selection alignment that, that, that I referenced. Um, but what we find is once they can no longer run for re-election, the effect of money drops off pretty dramatically. And what that tells us, we think, is that when judges don't have to worry about getting money for their reelection, the effect of money on their decision making is a lot less. They are, we think, not biased any longer by the worry uh, about these re-election considerations. And, and, and we think that's, that's really worrying about what's going on with the judges who can run for re-election because they are being affected. And we're not saying that it's necessarily conscious, as I mentioned. Um, it's not like they're, they're deciding, I got to decide this case. You know, I've got to violate the law to help out my, uh, my contributor. What we, we, we certainly find in, in the data, and Joanna um, can discuss this uh, in more detail, is all these other things matter too. Law matters. And we have studies that show that law matters. But in an important way, the money also matters. Uh, And I think our book demonstrates this kind of biasing worry in a way that no one in the literature has so far. And I'll just add a, a kind of a, a bit of uh, context for for the things that, that Michael just described. So when he said that we find a, a dramatic um, kind of decrease in the 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 way that money matters for these lame duck judges, the judges who um, can't run for reelection, um, we actually find that the the relationship between money and their voting decreases by between half and two thirds. So it's still there a little bit, right? Between a third and a half, I guess. And, and we again, you know, think that's because 
money does have a selection effect and money is really important to winning elections. About 90% of the time, the candidate who's raised the most money wins. And so it's natural that when donors are able to um, get their preferred candidate on the bench, that those preferred candidates are probably going to vote the way that everybody expected them to in the first place. But it's interesting that this relationship between money and um, the way the judges decide cases decreases so significantly between a half and two thirds. It's pretty large. And, and, you know, to go to the point too, that Michael's made that we don't think people are necessarily, I mean, we have no evidence and we would never, you know, assume that anybody's like consciously making this decision. There have been some famous surveys of large numbers of state Supreme court judges. Now we didn't do this. This was other groups that have done this at various Uh, conferences for these judges and whatnot. And these polls or surveys do suggest that judges also think this is a problem. So just to kind of give you a few numbers, about 60% of state Supreme Court justices feel a great deal deal of pressure to raise money for campaigning while they're electing. 85% of these state Supreme Court justices feel that interest groups are trying to use their campaign contributions to affect public policy. And almost half of the justices feel that campaign contributions to judges have at least a little influence on decisions. So when you ask judges directly, and again, they're not saying, half of them are not saying this affected my decision making, but half of them do think it influences decision making at least a little bit. Um, There's also kind of, uh, we have some quotes from justices who have retired, who say things like, you know, you, there was just always this nagging feeling in the back of your head, thinking that it might do you well to vote one way or another for your future election prospects. Um, and so we've presented this work um, th- throughout the past decade to a lot of different groups of judges. And like, honestly, when I first started presenting it, I was a little bit nervous of, of you know, that they would think we were attacking them or whatever. But that almost never happens. They always th- uh, tend to agree that the system is just I don't, I don't know if broken is too strong of a word, but has become increasingly concerning um, with the amount of money. Um, most judges who enjoy judging don't want to be out campaigning and having to raise campaign funds. And so the majority of the judges we talk to really, really dislike the system, and they're not surprised by our results. They agree it's probably happening, again, you know, not, not necessarily for themselves. Um, and, and they're as concerned as we are about you know, what the future holds. Yeah, the judges are not the bad guys in our story by any means. I mean, what we try to be careful about explaining is they're they're subject to these incentives that they have to either comply with or they're driven out of the system. And our our interview data, you know, that when we when we talk to it, several different judges and kind of tell a richer story about what they've been through, sort of tries to depict some of that. I think the the kind of um, poster child for our book is a guy named Brent Benjamin, uh, who was the subject of a Supreme Court case, um, Caperton. And he was elected uh, in 2004 to the West Virginia Supreme Court, which flipped essentially the control of the court um, on the strength of about $3 million in uh, campaign spending by the CEO of a coal company uh, that was facing a $50 million verdict against it that they had appealed to the West Virginia Supreme Court. And later, Benjamin was the decisive vote on the appeal and overturning that verdict. So in terms of the the return on investment that we discussed earlier, that was a really big payoff for that coal company and the, that CEO. He spent about $3 million and he got, after interest, a $70 million jury verdict flipped back. But what I think a lot of people are familiar with Caperton who are kind of working in this area, the story that most people don't know is what happened to Brent Benjamin afterward. Ended up that he was a he was a Republican, he was a conservative on uh, the West Virginia Supreme Court, but he ended up disappointing his backers. He didn't do what they wanted in lots of different cases, um, not necessarily related to the the coal company or anything like that, but in other areas having to do with um, uh, liability for prescription drug uh, abuse and things like that, and he ran for reelection. Uh, I think 12 years later. And I saw him at the University of Virginia Law School at a conference, and he said he'd really changed his mind about campaign finance, that he had underestimated uh, how much of an effect it has on judges. And he ended up not getting the support of his Republican backers, uh, the people who had supported him the first time. They actually sponsored a different candidate, and he ended up losing. 
Um, and so a lot of these judges, I think a, 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 a quote that we have in the book is that they think of campaign finance considerations as a crocodile in the bathtub, that they go in the morning in the bath and there's this crocodile sitting there that might eat them. And they, they might not eat them today. Um, it might not bother them today, but it's always there. It's always kind of lurking. And they can't help uh, but think about it. <laughs> right. And Brent Benjamin uh, didn't feed the crocodile. You know, it, it eventually got him because when he ran, he didn't serve his contributors. And when he ran for reelection, he didn't get their support. They supported someone else and he lost. Um, and the fact that Brent Benjamin, who was this, this candidate who had received so much support initially refused to recuse in this case that obviously mattered to his contributors. And that verdict was overturned by the West Virginia Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court on appeal said uh, Brent Benjamin was wrong. He should have recused. He was constitutionally required to recuse. Um, he really changed his views about things with uh, 12 years experience in the system. So the judges here are doing the best they can. I think they're trying to um, uphold the law as best they can, um, but they're subject to these incentives uh, and the 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 need to run for re-election and raise campaign money to win re-election is a real serious problem for them in terms of being impartial and and being fair to the people in front of them in court. You are listening to Broken Law, brought to you by the American Constitution Society. If you're enjoying Broken Law, consider becoming a member of ACS today. You do not need to be a lawyer to be a member. As we discuss so often on this podcast, our laws and legal systems impact all of us. By supporting ACS, you support Broken Law, our work to diversify the federal bench, and our advocacy for Supreme Court reform. You also become a member of our nationwide network. Learn more about ACS by visiting our website at acslaw.org. And now back to the conversation. I want to narrow in on, on that point, which is this difference with that when you have a lame duck justice, somebody who can't run, you don't seem the same bias. You see them not respond as much to the money or maybe not respond at all. And it's just, you know, when you, you think of the influence of campaign funding, I think what we often think of is that votes are being purchased, right? You elect somebody and therefore they will vote a certain way. But what your data shows is that people, that judges change or or influence their decision-making in anticipation of receiving donors, that it's the fear of not being able to raise money that is what's influencing their decision-making. Yeah. So, What's interesting about that Caperton case is the U.S. Supreme Court decides that campaign finance considerations do affect judges and it raises a risk of bias. But the way the court reasons about this, which is reasonable, is that judges have a need to reciprocate the the generosity of these donors. They need to pay back. What we find is almost the opposite, that it's not really the need to pay back. That actually, once judges are freed of re-election, they don't pay them back. Uh, They're not really trying to reciprocate. Instead, they do what they think they should do. But when they do have to run for re-election, they're worried about it. They have to feed the crocodile and they've got to do things that maybe they wouldn't otherwise do. Whether it's consciously or unconsciously, they they seem to behave differently. Um, And so there's a kind of optimistic element to our book, which is we find that Selection matters, and that's kind of baked into the system in some sense. Selection but, meaning like you, a donor says, I need somebody who is pro-business, and therefore you naturally go out to somebody that you think is going to be pro-business. Right, right. right. So the money I mean, if you're going to allow people... just elected that they want to get elected, right. Yeah, which yeah. is usually goes down by party, right? In a partisan election, you choose the candidate who's running for your party. Yeah, it makes sense that contributors are going to give money to candidates that support you know, what they support and that those candidates once elected are going to do what their contributors think they're going to do. Right. So um, that once we decide we're going to have elections and we're going to have campaign finance contributions and and, um, allow all of that for lots of different uh, reasons, um, that's going to be part of the story. Right. So that's in a way it's unavoidable once we head down this path. But the optimistic part of our book, I think, is that 
we find that once you get rid of re-elections, actually the money matters a lot less. Um, and so it's not just the problem of judicial elections, because there's lots of reasons to have judicial elections. Um, people like them. They, they, they like the ability to choose judges or throw out judges they, they think have done something wrong. And we don't really challenge that too much in the book. I mean, one could, um, but our, our story is about the problem of money. And what we find is getting rid of the prospect of re-election does a, a lot to alleviate the problem of, of money biasing the way that judges do their job. So that's an optimistic story that you don't have to get rid of judicial elections altogether if you- You get remove... rid of judicial re-elections. Exactly, right. So if you get rid of that, then um, you're going a long way to solving the, the problem of money in judicial elections um, without you know, getting rid of judicial elections altogether, which is not very popular. Uh, and, and we think is politically probably a bit un- infeasible right now. I want to get into the recommendation you both make about the one term solution, but I, I want to just touch on the data. This book is so data driven, and I think it's impossible to explain charts on a podcast, so I'm not going to ask. But, you know, there is going to be some portion of this that is selection, as you just noted, right? Donors are going to go for the candidate that's naturally predisposed to their issues. So how did you sift through the data to focus in on what the influence of money is versus other factors? Sure. Um, so I, I, we tried really hard to make the majority of the main chapters very readable and understandable to anybody, even if they don't have any specialized statistical training. We put a lot of our more technical tables in like the appendix that people can feel free to ignore. But basically what we did is, is we, we, ran, we did something called a multiple regression, which it What it basically does is it allows you to include a lot of different factors that you think affect the way judges decide cases. So, for example, not just money, but maybe, you know, uh, is the judge Republican or Democrat? Um, Is the judge in a state where the citizens in the state are particularly conservative or is the law particularly liberal? Um, Is there re-election approaching or is it farther away? We include a lot of these different variables, even the strength of the specific case that the judge is hearing. And what our regression allows us to do is isolate the influence of each of those different variables so that we can really kind of tease out exactly what the role of money is as separate from these dozens of other variables that we also include, these dozens of other factors. Um, And so that's kind of the way that the analysis is done. We do a lot of different uh, what, you know, in the statistical world, people call robustness checks. But what that really just means is we want to make sure that our results are not caused by something other than money. So for example, we do a lot of different checks on like age. Are we sure it's not just as judges age that they're likely to, you know, ignore the money more? And we have various ways to to control for that. Basically the um, there's 32 states that have mandatory retirement ages for their judges, and which means there's 18 states that don't have mandatory retirement ages. So one of the things we do is we just limit our sample to only looking at judges over the age of 60 um, to see is there a difference in the states where the judges would have to retire versus where they don't. And we find that there is indeed a difference. So it's not age. Um, we look at you know the way that the, the judge was originally um, selected. We look at other specifics of the states. We look at other reasons why judges might be leaving the bench. So in addition to being forced to retire, sometimes judges may voluntarily retire. Sometimes they might get promoted. Um, They might switch to another job. They may unfortunately get sick or die. And none of the effects exist for any of those other reasons why judges might be in their last few years of their term. It's only when the judges know there's no way they can run for reelection do we actually see these effects. And so I won't go too much into the statistical modeling because most people really don't want to hear about that. Um, but, uh, you know, and I, and I think we, 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 we did a pretty good job in the book of explaining it in a way that, that seems very intuitive so that people don't have to rely on the graphs and the tables. Can I just ask, because I, I have a feeling that we'll have listeners who are going to ask this and I can hear it in my head. Of, what, was there any distinction between red and blue states, between, you know, elections where the judges are associated with a party and those that aren't? Did you see any other distinctions that impacted how much uh, justice was influenced by the money? 
So in this study, we're just really focused on the money and the judges voting. We do, again, have controls, um, these other factors, which include like what state the judge is from and, and what their political party is. And, and so we're just really focused on what we call the lame duck judges versus the non-lame duck judges. And we weren't looking for a different effect. And we really find that money matters differently for Republican and Democratic judges, depending on what kind of money you're looking at. So we've actually done a lot of studies by this point. We've looked at money from business interest groups. We've looked at money from political parties. We've looked at money from other kinds of interest groups like insurance or healthcare. Um, we've looked at money from just kind of like general kind of uh, ideological groups, which may share the same uh, preferences. And it really kind of depends on what kind of money you're talking about for whether the impact is larger on Democratic or Republican judges, which isn't really a surprise. I mean, the incentives are there for everybody. Um, and so th- that that hasn't necessarily surprised us. And then I want to ask this, and again, the best that you can when we're talking about numbers, what is the impact numerically, right? It, is it a 5% impact? Is it a massive impact? It, I'm just curious because it's one thing to say that there is an impact and then kind of what the size of it is. Yeah, no, of course. So, so in our data, so we looked at every state Supreme court judge in every state over uh, between 2010 and 2012 and, and their decisions. And we were specifically focused in this particular study on the impact of contributions from business groups. We're not trying to, to beat up on business groups. It just so happens they're one of the biggest funders in these races. So you like, I was going to say, I bet there's a lot of money coming from them. You have a lot of money. You also have a lot of cases, about a third of the cases before state Supreme Court involve business issues. And so it's really just a matter of having enough data to be able to, to you know measure something. And as I said, in past studies, we've looked at uh, money from other sources as well. Um, but during this period, the average contribution from business groups to the to a, to an individual judge is roughly $85,000, right? So from a business group's perspective, that's not a lot of money. And what our study shows is that a doubling of that money, so if instead of contributing 85,000, it instead was 170,000, and again, this is averaged across states you find that there's about a 34% increase in the judge's likelihood of voting for the business litigant. And so that's significant, right? So, you know, an an extra $85,000 from a business interest group for a lot of business interest groups is not that much money. And for that, you get, according to our estimation, on average, an 80, a 34% increase in the likelihood that the judge casts a pro-business vote. And that is, again, because the impact is so much about when, is about a justice anticipating the next donation, right? So it's receiving that donation and then anticipating or seeking out, I'm assuming an equal contribution for the re-election. And that's where the bias comes in. Right. And again, there, there tends to be some continuity between the donors who are con- contributing. Right. And so it's, you know, either hoping to maintain the contributions from that um, group or receive similar contributions from similar groups. And so it's kind of a, a measure, you know, a judge's best guess about, um, you know, where their future money is going to come from is kind of looking at their most recent campaign. Yeah. So it's not a quid pro quo. Your uh, justice yep. is not paying them back. It's more of like, they were my biggest funder last time. I need them to be my biggest funder next time. And that's where the influence comes in. Right. Cause as Mike, as Michael, you know, said, if it was just about paying someone back, yeah. well, lame duck judges also have to pay people back. They were reelected into this lame duck period. And so they would have as much gratitude in the sense of, of, of paying someone back. But the fact that the money matters so much less for them suggests that that's definitely, if it is part of the story, it's only a small part of the story. And it tends to be this forward looking, anticipating needing to raise money in your next reelection, which is really the big, the big issue. So Professor Kang hinted at this, which is the solution is to get rid of re-elections. You can have elections, you just can't have the re-election. So talk to me about that. The solution is a single term across the board. Yeah, 
there's lots of ways to get rid of re-election. You could just have lifetime tenure the way the federal judges. They're appointed. Once they're confirmed, they're in for life. They never have to face re-election, reappointment, anything. The state systems are all over the map. Uh, there are some states where it's lifetime tenure. There's only a handful. Um, there's uh, states where you have to be reappointed. So it's not re-election, but someone has to put you back in. Um, but in a lot of states do have to run for re-election of some sort. Um, and that's where we see the problem. So um, one could go lots of different directions here. And to be honest with you, we're not so picky about the which solution. I think they have different strengths and and weaknesses. Um, but what we propose in the book is that you're elected to one long term, but then you don't run for re-election. So everyone's a lame duck once you're elected uh, the first time that you, you can't run for re-election because we think that gets rid of these problematic uh, incentives. Um, and we think we work, we sort of work through the, the analysis in the book. We don't think that would probably change the nature of the job too much. I think career lengths would probably be similar. The time spent on the state Supreme Court would be similar for lots of reasons that we describe in the book. You, usually state Supreme Court justices, you need to accumulate a certain amount of experience and um, professional standing to be able to run for the highest court uh, in your state. It's a little different than running for you know the state assembly, for instance. Um, and so we don't think that the the starting age would change too dramatically. And given that now the state uh, Supreme Court terms are shorter, but you can run for re-election, what we're proposing is one term, but it's longer. Um, so we think on average, probably state Supreme Court justices would serve about the same amount of time. Um, so we're not trying to change the job. We just want to get rid of the re-election incentive on the back end. There's lots of other things that we would support, like campaign finance reform. Are, are, it's probably a good idea as a general matter um, in these areas. So you don't see cases like Caperton where one donor can make such a such a disproportionate impact that the U.S. Supreme Court thought it was uh, presenting this risk of bias. So we would support that, too. Um, and we're not so against lifetime tenure, which is the way the federal model works. But as we describe in the book, all of these different regimes have their own drawbacks and political disadvantages. Campaign finance reform faces all kinds of constitutional limitations um, that I talk about in my other life as, as an election lawyer. And, and the federal model of a lifetime appointment is facing a lot of criticism today because you get judges that are really old, that are there for a really long time. Um, and the confirmation process is a mess, as we see at the federal model. So you sort of change where the politics occur without necessarily changing the way the job is done. Our proposal is essentially we'll keep the, the, the system of elections, judicial elections. We'd be happy with campaign finance reform. But what we're arguing is that by just getting rid of re-elections, we might not change the job very much. We might not change the, the discretion that the public has in terms of shaping the state judiciary. But we, we, we achieve this important step with a fairly modest tweak to the system, we would argue, um, of just getting rid of re-elections, allow them to serve a really long time, they'll accumulate experience, get good at their jobs, which I think is important. But we think this re-election incentive um, is really perverse and leads to the problems that we um, discuss a lot in our book. To add on to what Michael said, you know, as he mentioned, you know, we're not trying to, to change the job, but we do suspect that it might change who would be willing to run um, for in these elections in the first place. Because, of course, for a lot of people and a lot of people who have the skills and temperament, which would make them a great judge, it feels very distasteful to, to run in these elections. So we hope that they might be able to tolerate the initial election a little bit more knowing it's, it's a one and done kind of deal. And, and there's no gonna, incumbent. Yeah. Well, right. But also they're not going to have to do this every six years or, you know, I mean, every state has not every state, but there's a lot of different term lanes, but in some states it's as short as four or six years. And so we think for a judge, especially somebody who, um, you know, may happen to have a, you know, a temperament, which would make them a great judge that just feels so, just just distasteful that they're going to be continue to have to campaign. We hope that this reform would, although there is still the initial election, it would make the idea of having to continue to run for re-election, um, it, it, that would go away so that we might have different kinds of people willing to even be a judge in the first place. More like we had back in the old days. Um, one of the things that 
when we talked about uh, the way money has has increased really starting in the early 90s, there's some interesting kind of historical projects out there looking at what state Supreme Court races were like before that. And, you know, they, they tended to be oftentimes they're they were not contested. So you just had one candidate. Uh, one of the, the the researchers described it as as exciting as a game of checkers played by mail. So they were just slow, like they just weren't it wasn't all this politicization that we see today. And so presumably that appealed to a different kind of candidate than the current races do. Are there any states moving in this direction? Or I should know this, but I don't. Is there any state that currently has a one term that's short like this? No, um, th- there are some states that have that give their um, judges permanent tenure. Uh, Ma- Massachusetts, yeah. New Hampshire, and Rhode Island. Uh, the judges are uh, appointed initially, and then they serve forever. They don't have to be reappointed. But in all of the other forty-seven states, um, there's some method of retention, either a reelection or a reappointment by the governor or the legislature. Are there any states taking this up? Is is there state le- is there legislation pending on any of this? I know in, from having worked in New Hampshire, there's always an interest in getting rid of mandatory retirement, um, but that's that's a different issue. Not a, not that I'm aware of, at least not yet. But our book just came out, so maybe that will. Happen. I was I was just going to say we always like to end these episodes with a question for listeners who are really interested. What can they do? And I guess one of them is you know start start pursuing this at your state level. Um, But I do want to offer that question to both of you. For listeners, I will say the first thing they should go do is read the book. And a reminder, the book is called Free to Judge, The Power of Campaign Money in Judicial Elections. But in addition to reading the book, for folks who are interested in this topic, are there other resources you would point them to or are there actions that you would suggest they take? Well, I'll mention one thing while Michael's thinking about the answer to that question, which is since 1990, there have been five states that have reformed the way that they select or retain state Supreme Court justices. None of them have adopted this reform. Most of those uh, five states have just kind of you know traded in one method for another. Instead of doing partisan election, we're going to do a nonpartisan election or whatever. But reform is not unheard of. It, it it may not happen at the pace we'd like to see, but it does happen. Yeah, I, I think the thing that I would advise is for voters to take state Supreme Court elections seriously and know more about and, and learn more about the candidates. What we find um, in these races is the money gets spent on a lot of really inflammatory advertising that really doesn't speak to the merits of the candidates very well or represent what the candidates are about. Um, and I think that's because these are low salient elections where voters don't know a lot about um, the candidates and they tend to rely on advertising pretty heavily uh, to uh, decide how to vote. Um, and I think that makes the electorate more vulnerable to these kinds of um emotional appeals and irrational appeals uh, in a way that maybe they're less susceptible um, with the bigger races the, at the top of the ballot. Um, so I hope that as these races become more competitive and the kind of political players spend more energy on them, that the electorate also starts to ramp up the way they think about these races and the consequences of them and take them more seriously. Because I think right now the political players are able to take advantage of the fact that the average voter doesn't know a lot about the state Supreme Court candidates, um, but these are enormously consequential uh, races that we should care a lot about and, and learn about. Here, here. If the voters knew more about the specific candidates, the money wouldn't have such a determinative effect on the way that the voters are necessarily voting because it wouldn't matter what they saw on TV or on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, they would know enough about the candidates to vote the way they wanted to. And if the money wasn't mattering so much, presumably the judges wouldn't feel such pressure to have to vote in a way that would help them raise money because the money wouldn't be as important. I cannot agree with you more. It's one of the points that we make the strongest, particularly in election years, which is care about down ballot races, particularly state court races. I think everybody knows we're heading into a Goliath of an election season. So it's a great reminder to really pay attention to down ballot races, especially state Supreme Court races. 
Thank you so much, Professor Kane, Professor Shepard, for joining me on this episode. And again, a reminder, the book is called Free to Judge. It is now available wherever you purchase your books. Uh, If you missed our earlier episodes about the attacks being lobbed on duly elected state Supreme Court justices, I encourage you to go back to episodes 121 and 127. And if you're enjoying the show, please help us bring it to more listeners by recommending it to a friend and leaving us a review. Make sure to follow us on social media at ACS Law on Twitter and at American Constitution Society on Instagram and using hashtag Broken Law Podcast. Together, we'll speak truth to power about the law, whose interests it really serves, and whose it does not. 